Welcome to the Christian Mysticism Podcast, where we explore the fascinating history of Christian mysticism from the early days of the church until today. I'm Alberto de la Cruz, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Carlos Ayer, the T. Lawrenson Riggs Professor of History and Religious Studies at Yale University. Well, Carlos, today is Thursday, the first Thursday of April. We're releasing this episode, and it happens to be Holy Thursday, so a happy Holy Thursday to you. Yes, and to you too. It's my youngest son's birthday on the 31st, and he, he was born on Holy Thursday. I always put those two things together. So can't believe a oh, Holy Week already. It's Holy Week, so I, I wish you and all our listeners a happy Holy Thursday and a, and a happy Easter, and he is risen. Yes, indeed. Last episode, we talked about Bernard of Clairvaux. So what do you have for us this episode? Well, um, what we're uh, covering today are, are two different texts or uh, sets of texts that on the surface might look like they don't belong together, but they really do. And they've, the reason that we're following up from Bernard to this is that it all has to do with the relationship between brain and heart or head and heart if, if you want to put it this way you can also put it as um reason not versus but you know the, the the dialectic or interplay between reason and faith and christian mysticism can be very cerebral even when it's the mystic is telling you that you have to get out of your brain basically which is what we're going to be covering today how you get out of your brain uh, so uh, the, the link with Bernard is that Bernard was very painfully aware of developments that were taking place in the universities. And the universities were, were new. It was a new invention, the university. The theological schools and the university, he was very painfully aware, and I stress that pain, about the way in which there was a lot of arguing in the university classrooms. And there was a, a, a lot of probing of the deepest mysteries and he was not at all happy about this development so in in some textbooks you you might read that bernard was uh, opposed to scholastic theology he wasn't really opposed to the goals of scholastic theology he was opposed to the way in that which many theologians uh, were conducting their investigations so can you get to God by reasoning? Bernard would say, no, not at all. And he was also very upset by all the bickering and, and all the um, social climbing that some theologians were, were doing. So who's, who's the smartest man, for instance? So um, here's a juicy quote from St. Bernard. In the forests, you will find more than in books. The trees and rocks will teach you things that no master will ever tell you. The master being the professor in the university classroom. And uh, another quote from him, the master's lessons place a separation between the soul and Christ to no good end. And, and that bears repeating, the master's lessons place a separation between the soul and Christ to no good end. Just remember his motto in Latin was anima querens verbum, the soul seeking the word. And I have two more quotes that sum up his conflict with scholastic theology uh, very nicely. First one is, the true school, the one where you do not pay your master and you do not argue is Christ's school. Medieval universities, by the way, professors didn't get a salary. They, they got paid by each student. So the more students they had, the more money they made, <laughs> which made them compete fiercely sometimes for students. So you shouldn't have to pay for theology. You shouldn't have to pay for knowledge of God. And the final quote I have is my favorite. Intelligence is love itself. Very nice paradoxical proposition there. Intelligence is love itself. 
So one of his um, targets was a theologian named Peter Abelard. And maybe in another podcast, we can come back to this. Peter, Peter Abelard was accused by Barnard of being not at all interested in real intelligence based on his quote, intelligence is love itself, but rather on you know self-aggrandizement. But we can come back to that some other time, perhaps. But for, for today, the two sets of texts that we have that on the surface might not seem to belong together have to do with, as I said before, how one gets to experience God. And you know, this is one of the most basic questions of not just Christian mysticism, but all mysticism, which is, is, is this about knowledge, getting to know God? Or, you know, or is it about affection, about loving God? And of course, these two things are always uh, in constant tension with each other. They're not opposed to each other, but they're in constant tension with each other. And what it boils down to is, you know, how you pray. And when you're praying, of course, you are speaking, right? You're speaking. Who, is this speaking uh, thinking? And when you finally do break through uh, to the other dimension, what you are experiencing, is it being experienced in a rational way in your mind or in an emotional uh, way in your heart? And, and that's what we have to sort out today, two very similar approaches. Would you say that Bernard's main problem or, or the conflict that, that existed there between him, the mystic, and or mystics, and the scholastic side was looking at God on a human level, on how do I understand God on a human level, as opposed to St. Bernard, who looked at it from a spiritual level, understanding God on a spiritual level? That's right, because uh, what, they, what they started to do in the universities, the scholastic theology, was that they would wrestle with propositions about God, such as, for instance, the following, which I've read an entire dissertation on this question. Can God make a woman a virgin again after she has been raped? Seriously, Peter Damien, a medieval scholastic theologian, took up this question. Or, uh, you know, can God make a stone too heavy for him to lift? In other words, topics that really don't serve much of a purpose in, in terms of getting closer to God. That's right. That's right. And, and not only that, you know, people's careers are hanging in the balance, you know, who has the cleverest arguments. And, and what he really did not like the most about Peter Abelard was that um, Abelard wrote a textbook you know, a theology textbook called Seek It Known, Yes and No, Yes and No, where he, he collected biblical passages and, and passages from the church fathers that seemed to disagree with each other, right? And he would have the students, he would read these to the students and, and then ask them to um, come up with some sort of solution here. How do you reconcile these seemingly opposite propositions? That, that bothered Bernard to no end because it could lead to doubt instead of faith. So it's so different from the life of a mystic. However, before I get, we get going on, on today's topic, there are scholastic theologians who were also mystics. It's not impossible to reconcile the two things. And one of, one of the greatest uh, theologians of the Middle Ages, uh, St. Bonaventure, a Franciscan, uh, was was a great theologian. And some would say that Thomas Aquinas was a mystic too. Uh, he certainly had one experience towards the end of his life that, that changed his path completely. But we can come back to that. The, the two very similar sets of texts that we have for today have to do with prayer. And we haven't really touched on this subject much up till now. But mysticism is all about prayer. The way to crossing over to the other dimension is always prayer. You can't get there without prayer. So how does one pray? And 
how is that prayer connected to one's experience of the divine? Well, let's just start at this point. Monks and nuns have vocal prayer constantly. Same way as lay people have liturgical prayer when they go to mass, there's liturgical prayer. But in monasteries and convents, monks and nuns have vocal prayer constantly at set times of the day. They get together and they pray. And most of the earlier uh, rules, monastic rules, had monks and nuns going over the Psalms, the biblical Psalms, over and over and over and over again. And they either recite them or chant them. So sometimes it's to music, sometimes it's not. But it's constant, several times a day. Everything stops. They gather together in the chapel and they pray. And then they always have mass every day as well. So there's a lot of sound connected to prayer. And not only that, the day is subdivided into segments, very specific segments of communal prayer. And then depending on you know how, how a rule is being followed, it, in, in most of them, the monk or nun would also have time for private prayer. How's that prayer carried out? Well, it could be vocal, but it could also be silent. Uh, the way that most people pray now, I think, is inside their heads. And uh, I still remember a, a student asked me very seriously, said, you know, uh, if I'm praying inside my head, how can God hear me? <laughs> Good question, I said. Uh, but, you know, I don't have the answer. How? That's that's for a scholastic theologian. How does God hear prayer? So what is the origins of these two schools of prayer? Right. Assigned they, it a name. They, they are both monastic, but two places that are far apart from each other. One is this text called The Cloud of Unknowing. We don't know who wrote it. 14th century England. The other is a style of prayer known as hesychasm, and it's Greek. And there was a huge controversy over the way that hesychast monks were praying also in the 14th century. So the greatest defense of his Acast prayer by uh, a monk named Gregory Palamas, who is uh, venerated as a saint in the Orthodox Church, Saint Gregory Palamas, uh, defended his Acast successfully against some who were uh, challenging it. But let's um, back up a, a few steps and focus on what it is that links these two texts uh, Palamas's defense of the Hesychasts and the cloud of unknowing. And what links them is that both of them have to do with, as I said before, getting out of your brain in prayer, of basically derailing linear logical thought in some way through language. I know this sounds a bit odd, but it's, it's actually fairly simple once we get down to brass tacks and, and, and examine what both of these uh, texts, Palamas's text and the Cloud of Unknowing have to say, because the Cloud of Unknowing is the one mystical text in the Christian tradition that has the most detailed advice on how to pray. But it's only one kind of, I mean, there are many different kinds of, of prayer that mystics engage in, but this is a very specific kind. So what is it? It's silent prayer. It's getting beyond words and beyond language. And let's start with the hesychasts rather than the cloud of unknowing, because this method had been practiced um, among the Orthodox for several centuries before it became controversial. What is hesychasm? Well, it comes from the Greek word hesychia, which means silence. So it's all about silence. What kind of silence? Well, it starts out not as silence, but that is your, your end point, is to reach a kind of silence that transcends language. But you get there by using language. And what developed in the Eastern Orthodox monasteries, in, in many of them, was 
a way of simplifying prayer, right? It's not about reciting all 150 Psalms over and over and over again, right? And some of them are very long. It's simplifying everything and also focusing on Christ and even more specifically, focusing on the name Jesus. So here, painting a verbal picture of what Hezekiah's monks do is first you have to be very still and then you have to sit up very straight and you try to join a very simple prayer, which is called the Jesus prayer with your breathing. What is the Jesus prayer? Jesus prayer is calling out to Jesus, sometimes with a phrase such as the best known one is Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And repeating that over and over and over and over. Or simply just reciting the name of Jesus over and over and over again. While you join this saying of the name or saying of the short prayer with your breathing and gazing at your abdomen as you breathe to see your own breathing. So see, it's very physical. It's, it's conjoining the verbal and the physical. Would you consider this to be like a meditation? Well, it's not, it, in Christian terms, it's not a meditation. It's never called a meditation. It's called a prayer. But compared to what meditation is in other religions and the way it's carried out, you know, it sounds an awful lot like some kinds of Buddhist meditation. Right. That's why I, I mentioned that, because as yeah. you describe it, it's al it almost sounds like sitting with your legs crossed, uh, with your hands on your knees and, and chanting, right. um, yeah, in, as, in the lotus the, position, yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, but but yeah. I know it's I, I know it's a prayer. So I, I think you know I and and our and our listeners would be interested to know what what makes it different. Well, what makes it different, and that's the the key issue is you are reaching out to Jesus with the Jesus prayer. You're not getting a a word a mantra from some guru. Oh, repeat this over and over again. Om om om. What do I, no. You're praying to Jesus. You're reaching out to Jesus. You're invoking Jesus. And you are trying to bring your whole self, including your body, into a rhythmic prayer that could do something to your thinking and your brain and make you cross over to the other dimension. There are similarities between some kinds of Buddhist prayer methods and all this, but there is no smoking gun, so to speak. No evidence that connects Eastern Buddhist monasteries with these Greek monasteries. The way you describe it, for me, I would see it as with Buddhists and, and meditation, you're, you're focusing on your inner self and turning all your energy towards your inside, towards yourself. But with this type of prayer, you're focusing your inner self on God and reaching, yes. looking out instead of in typical Buddhist meditation would be looking inwards. Or inwards and out, <laughs> out of yourself. If I'm glad you brought this up because what, what is, was, what's the difference really between this focusing on self and Buddhism and ultimately, you know, you have to realize that whatever is around you is, is illusion and you have to get beyond that. So there is this similarity that these, his caste monks are always try, uh, uh, always, you know, rhythmically uh, praying, but they too are trying to get beyond to another dimension. Big difference is they're pointing straight at God. And not only that, they're pointing straight at God incarnate in the person of Jesus. The Jesus prayer, whatever version of it, is aimed at God rather than self. And that's the key difference between this kind of mysticism, Hezekiah's mysticism, and some forms of Asian religion. Because 
God is a person. And not only that, God is a person who became a human being. So the Jesus prayer, repeated over and over, according to his casts, eventually allow you or allows you to experience the divine light. But of course, this what is this divine light? That's where the controversy came up in the 14th century. There was a theologian in Constantinople named Barlam, B-A-R-L-A-A-M. Barlam had studied theology in the West. So he was very familiar with scholastic theology and, and uh, distinctions, and especially Aristotelian distinctions. And he accused all the Hezekiah monks of heresy because they were claiming to see the divine light. And Barlam argued human eyes are created. They cannot see the divine light because that is uncreated. So you see how these things are kind of link up. We're back to scholastic theology in a different setting. And um, the Hezekiah monks found a, a very, very able defender in Gregory Palamas, who made a very fine distinction. Also, he knew his Aristotle. He knew how to combat uh, the arguments of somebody like Barlam. And he said that, no, we're not actually seeing the divine light itself. What we're seeing is the energy of the divine light. <laughs> Happy ending of the story for the Hesychasts is that Palamas's argument won the day over and against Barlam. But if we pause for a second and try to piece together these two things, what the Hesychasts were doing, which they had been doing for several centuries, and then the opposition to them and how it's overcome, it's all basically about with the use of Jesus's name over and over and over again, getting to a point where you have some kind of experience of the divine that is beyond the physical world. That's what it's all about. The crossing over that we've uh, talked about before many times, which is the essence of Christian mysticism, you know, experiencing the divine dimension. And um, this rhythmic method of prayer um, was ridiculed. Not only were they accused of heresy, but Barlam uh, ridiculed them, the Hezekiah monks, and called them omphaloscopoi, <laughs> navel gazers. <laughs> because they focused their attention on that rhythmic breathing and, and what they called the seat of the heart, which was the lower abdomen. And um, navel gazing is, um, in, in English anyway, has become kind of an, an insult. I mean, when you call somebody a navel gazer, you're, you're accusing them of actually not really dealing with reality. When in fact, what the Hezekiah monks were trying to do was to experience the ultimate reality. But it raises all sorts of questions, this Jesus prayer, about what's going on inside the brain. And by the way, for our listeners, if you look on YouTube, you can find several sites where the Jesus prayer is repeated constantly, set to music. And it's, it's computer generated, for heaven's sakes. I mean, it's so obviously the, the way you hear the voice in, in one of these websites, it's computer generated. So you can actually have like a Jesus prayer machine turned on as background. Will that get you there? I'm not so sure. I remember a few years back, I read a book. Actually, the book was recommended by you on the history of the schism between the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic Church. Right. And honestly, that was the first time I ever heard of the Jesus prayer was in reading that book, which was written by a Catholic that I converted over to Orthodox. And I started looking into it and reading up about it. And I went on YouTube and I didn't, I didn't run into that automated Jesus prayer video, but I did see some <laughs> Eastern Orthodox priests talk about it. And for me, for my prayer life, it's, I, I've really have gotten a lot of benefit for me spiritually with the Jesus prayer. I, I find myself reciting it sometimes just in the back of my mind as I'm doing things. And it, for me, at least, it's, it's been beneficial. Yeah, it, it, it can be. I mean, it's, it, it's tried, as, as a saying in English goes, tried and true. 
you know, it's been tried and people have obtained the results. And that's why the other text that I want to bring up is so significant and so important for understanding Christian mysticism. I'm not talking about, you know, differences between East and West or Catholic and Orthodox. This is just basic Christian mysticism, and it doesn't matter if you're Orthodox or Catholic. It's about <clears throat> encountering the divine. But this other text, The Cloud of Unknowing, from 14th century England, is an instruction manual. And it's a very detailed instruction manual. And it doesn't recommend the Jesus prayer, but it recommends something very similar. And, and, and it is this, finding a word that has a meaning and saying that word over and over again. So what the cloud of unknowing recommends, for instance, is say, a, just call on God, say God, 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 over and over again. And you repeat this with love in your heart. It can get you through. It can get you to the other dimension. Or conversely, you could, it advises, you could say, you can meditate on your own smallness and your sinfulness and say, for instance, the word sin over and over again to remind yourself of the distance that separates you from God. And the key to this kind of single word prayer, the cloud of unknowing emphasizes the key is love. Because at the very beginning of the text, it says human beings have two powers, a knowing power, our reason, and a loving power, our will. And says very clearly that knowing power will not get you to God. You can only get to God with the loving power. So again, I hope the, the link with what Bernard opposed in scholastic theology can be seen here again. See, this is part of the Christian mystical th tradition, not only joining us to Bernard and his conflict with scholastic theology, Palamas in the East with the Hesychasts against Barlam and his Aristotelian arguments, and the cloud of unknowing, which details how it is that focusing on a single word can get you to a point where you experience the divine. But here's a key difference between the Hesychasts and what's going on in the cloud of unknowing. The Hesychasts, you see the divine light. Cloud of unknowing, its very title tells you something weird is, is behind this method. It tells you you're not going to know. <laughs> yes. Uh, and actually, it was, it was written in Middle English. The goal of saying one word over and over and over and over again in Middle English is to become witless, <laughs> literally witless, wit being knowledge, reason. Here, here are the steps outlined in the Cloud of Unknowing. And it's not as weird as it seems. The language employed is that with a sheer willing, full of love to rise towards the divine, and I'm quoting, you enter the cloud of forgetting. What does that mean? Cloud of forgetting, what do you forget? Well, you forget your physical surroundings. You forget the physical world. You forget concepts. You have reached a level where you are no longer engaged in discursive reasoning. Or, as the monks um, do every day, several times a day, you know, reciting psalms. No, you've, you, you enter the cloud of forgetting, and then you keep going. And then you get to the cloud of unknowing, which means that you have reached that point where you're no longer thinking. You're beyond thought. You're experiencing the divine. It doesn't talk about divine light like the he's a casts. You're in a cloud. It's the cloud of unknowing. But another time we will have to deal with a sixth century Syrian monk, we think it was, Dionysius the Areopagite, and his text Mystical Theology, where he speaks of darkness beyond light. And this brings us to the realm of paradox, right? That what 
anyone sitting at their desk or on the couch or even standing up trying to figure out who God is just simply will not get there because if God is so far superior to human beings, the human mind cannot comprehend God. So the reality of God is beyond understanding. And that's what Dionysius calls the darkness beyond light. What the cloud, the author of the cloud of unknowing says is the cloud of unknowing. Do we know who wrote the cloud of unknowing? Was it one author or was it several? Opinion is yes, one, one author, but we don't know who. And several guesses have been made, but none of them have convinced everyone. It's also been suggested that perhaps it was written by a woman. It was definitely written by someone who was a hermit, right? And this is advice for hermits. And actually, there's a, there's a warning at the beginning of the book. This is not for the curious. So if, if you're the curious sort, you know, for, you know especially, you know, those uh, scholastic theologians, this book's not for you at all. So uh, this is a how-to book. And it has some funny places, funny as humorous. It pokes fun at people who think that there's some kind of spatial relationship between humans and the divine as if God is above and we're below. And it pokes fun at the poses that some people assume while praying. And, you know, immediately when I, I read that for the first time, I thought, oh, gee, maybe he'd be making the author of The Cloud of Unknowing would be poking fun at the hazacasts for, you know, insisting on a specific pose and rhythmic breathing and all this. So the payoff of the cloud of unknowing is that it's, it's for monks, it's for nuns. And this is something that requires real dedication. It's, you know, it's a simplified method of prayer, but it's, it's not something that one can do casually. The instructions say very clearly, this is for those who are really, really serious and want to devote themselves to, you know, seeking the divine through love, not through the knowledge power. And I think it's very, very revealing that this text, The Cloud of Unknowing, is from the 14th century. And it was also during the 14th century that the controversy about the Hesychasts uh, exploded in the Orthodox Church where basically we're talking about two very similar ways of praying, which at bottom what they do is they get you out of your brain. Listening to all of this, Carlos, I'm reminded of a Christian movement that's been that's become popular in the past few years that I've I've read about and listened to a couple of podcasts regarding it called the mindfulness movement. But I know that movement is inspired by by Buddhist tradition. Uh, obviously, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Well, the fact is there are parallels. As I always uh, say in my, my class to my students, you know, that when we're dealing with monasticism, there, there are, you know, striking similarities between Asian monasticism, you know, and Christian monasticism. I say, you know, there are only so many ways to skin a cat, so to speak. If you want to achieve a certain result, you know, you have to do certain things the same way to obtain that result. And that's the whole basis of empirical science is, you know, you repeat the experiment. But for instance, in Zen Buddhism, reciting, meditating on a paradoxical statement is the way to reach enlightenment. What kind of paradoxical statement? Any kind of paradoxical statement. The, 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 the word is koan, K-O-A-N, this, this, this kind of paradoxical statement. The best known, perhaps, being imagine the sound of one hand clapping over and over again and trying to get yourself out of linear reasoning. And in, in some traditions of Zen Buddhism, the master, the older experienced master, walks around as the younger monks are meditating, trying to achieve this enlightenment in one way in which some of these masters help their students achieve enlightenment is they carry around this uh, board or stick and they whack them on the back of the head 
as they're meditating on a koan. And sometimes that brings them to enlightenment. So I'm sorry, but that reminds me of the scene from Monty Python, Holy Grail, where the monks are walking and banging their heads with, with a tablet. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The thing is, in, in, in Zen Buddhism, you get whacked. You get you don't whack yourself. You get whacked on the back of the head by your master, the Zen master. And that brings you to enlightenment. But we don't have anything like that in Christian mysticism. But instead, we have the hesychasts and the cloud of unknowing. And um, the cloud of unknowing also has some passages that really uh, shed light on the way in which this is one tradition. Christian mysticism, there are various traditions of how best to pray and, and, and how to get somewhere else, that somewhere else being the, the divine realm. And it also has some statements about human existence that transcend Christian mysticism and transcend all kinds of mysticism, while at the very same time being very Christian. Let me give you an example. There's this, this passage, a series of passages in the Cloud of Unknowing that I'm going to read. Every man has plenty of cause for sorrow, but he alone understands the deep universal reason for sorrow, who experiences that he is. Every other motive pales besides this one. He alone feels authentic sorrow, who realizes not only what he is, but that he is. Anyone who has not felt this should really weep, for he has never experienced real sorrow. This sorrow purifies a man of sin and sin's punishment. Even more, it prepares his heart to receive that joy through which he will finally transcend the knowing and feeling of his being. You know, the 20th, said, 20th century philosophical school known as existentialism posed pretty much the same thing. Our problem as human beings is that we are and that existence is so limited that this, in fact, is the problem you're trying to transcend through mysticism. That last line, even more, the sorrow purifies a man of sin and sin's punishment. Even more, it prepares his heart to receive that joy through which he will finally transcend the knowing and feeling of his being. It's quite a text in, in this respect that it was meant for specialists, but passages such as this actually speak to everyone, not just those who are engaged full time in the mystical quest for union with God. I know you mentioned that these texts were not written for the layman. They were written for monks and for for nuns, for monastics, and obviously the Hesychas being from the Eastern Orthodox side of the church, that's something that the mystics in the Orthodox church would relate to and, and would study and, and would read. But in the cloud of the unknowing, coming from the Western side of the church, were there any mystics that adopted that, that followed it? Oh, this is... This is uh part of, a, as I said before, but didn't say it very clearly, you know, this is one tradition. Yes, this is part of a tradition. It has antecedents, you know, it's things that came before it that it's, you know, basing itself on. It's also quite obviously, you know, a, a tradition of prayer passed on from master to disciple. And it's also obviously connected to a whole tradition of focusing on the paradoxical otherness of the divine. And it's also part of this tradition that, uh, you know, we've talked about before, affective mysticism, you know, affective as in affection. It's all about love. And actually to, you know, show our listeners that even while it is advising the would-be experts to say God, 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 all over, over and over and over again, or sin, 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 sin. There's a prayer at the beginning of the text, which could be recited by anyone, a lay person, a monk, uh, even um, 
somebody who's highly skeptical about all religious claims. Uh, and the prayer goes like this, O God, unto whom all hearts lie open, unto whom desire is eloquent, and from whom no secret thing is hidden, purify the thoughts of my heart by the outpouring of your spirit, that I may love you with a perfect love and praise you as you deserve. Amen. But I want to focus on three things here in this prayer. Desire being eloquent. Notice, it, it's not speech. It's not prayers. It's not reasoning. It's desire that is eloquent. And then he asks God to purify the thoughts of my heart. Usually, thoughts are connected to mind, right? Not to heart. And then brings up asking for the outpouring of your spirit. So why is this outpouring of the spirit needed? To reach perfect love and praise you as you deserve. So you don't have to do the God, 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 or Jesus, 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 Jesus thing. You could say this over and over again. It's longer, but for those who are not hermits, <laughs> right? Or monks or nuns, this might be a lot more effective as a first step. I think one of the things that impresses me about this text is it leaves it up to the individual to choose the best way they feel or the best method they feel they can use to get closer to God. Yes, uh, while at the very same time telling you, look, it's the great beyond, right? It's the great beyond. Your, whatever it is that you have conceived of at this point in your life, before you begin any of this, be prepared for something. Come <laughs> and get back to Monty Python, something completely different. And um, it's on the surface it might seem hard to understand, but I think the simplest way of explaining what's going on here in the cloud of unknowing is to say and. Others have said this in different ways. The difference in intellect between humans and animals and lower species. What does a dog or a cat think when they hear humans speaking? <laughs> the difference is vast, but there is a point of likeness, you know, between all intelligence and uh, cats and dogs can think. Of course they can think. And they can act very intelligently, but there's no way that they could understand human thinking. So this comparison is, is usually made. Multiply that a billion times, and that's the difference between our thinking and the reality of God. Now, I know that you mentioned the cloud of unknowing starts off with a warning that this is not for the curious. Mm -hmm. But I assume listening to the quotes you've read that the text has been modernized uh, or rewritten in modern english would it oh, be yeah. would it be something you would recommend oh i i highly recommend it, it, this text to anyone um and there there are some translations the one i prefer the one i'm reading from is the translation by william johnston and apropos of the points in our conversation where buddhism came up Johnston taught at Sophia University in Tokyo, Japan, and he is an expert in Buddhism. <laughs> His translation, I mean, I, I can't pronounce Middle English, but this prayer, O God, unto all hearts lie open, unto whom desire is eloquent. Here's the Middle English. Best I, I I'm going to take a stab at the pronunciation, right? God, unto whom all hearts been open and unto whom Allah willa speaketh. <laughs> willa, W-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, being will, desire. Johnston translates that as desire, and I think that's perfect. It's beautiful. But, you know, thinking of nothing is very hard, or thinking of not thinking is very hard. And um, one of my favorite poets, Charles Simic, uh, has a poem entitled The One to Worry About. And I think it... Um, this is a skeptic's meditation on all of this paradox stuff, which could be considered 
nonsense or unattainable. And here's a, a stanza from Simic's poem, The One to Worry About. I quote, I failed miserably at imagining nothing. Something always came to keep me company. A small nameless bug crossing the table, the memory of my mother, the ringing in my ear. I was distracted and perplexed. A hole, H-O-L-E, a hole is invariably a hole in something. That's a cloud of unknowing, and he's a cast type, simple prayer for a skeptic to say over and over again. <laughs> well, I think probably the most fascinating thing to me in listening to all of this is as we as lay people look at mystics and, and read about mystics and learn about mystics of how it all seems so complicated and so out of our out of our way of thinking where in reality it's it's all very simple it's going back to simplicity going back to a very direct line or attempting to do a very direct line to god and just eliminating all the complications eliminating all of the things that would make it seem complicated and making it all simple that's right yeah you're right you're absolutely right and you know and looking forward to other podcasts and this issue of prayer and how one prays i am reminded of something that teresa of avila had to say about the best kind of prayer which she'll tell you it's one of the higher reaches higher kind of prayer that not everybody can get to it's a chat between friends <laughs> a chat between friends i forget what the spanish original is but that's that's a pretty good translation a chat between friends you get to a point where you're just chatting to a friend it's all about <laughs> keeping it simple yes yeah absolutely and well, um that line from the cloud of unknowing oh god unto whom desire is eloquent right desire is, or will in the middle english desire Everybody has desire, right? And everybody can be really eloquent because everybody really desires constantly. And especially when, and if we're talking about, you know, religious people, their, their desire, their ultimate desire is the divine. So it's reachable to everyone. Well, I think this episode gives us a good idea whether we want to be mystics or not just a good idea and, and some good advice on the best way to pray is to just keep it simple as simple as possible so now we reach the end of this show we do have a question from one of our listeners and this comes from one of our our very loyal listeners who's been listening to the podcast since since we started it and she wanted to know when will we do an episode on dionysus well, Dionysius the Areopagite is hard to do an entire episode on. For one thing, we don't know who this person was. And the <clears throat> mystical theology of Dionysius is extremely important, very important. But we've already touched today. We've touched today on it. what, what is its, its essence, which is about paradox and getting beyond and um, we we can start with him next time and uh, see how much we can present to our listeners about Dionysius without getting um, bogged down in, in, in certain very specific um, details of Dionysian mysticism. So we're going to start off with Dionysius. What's our episode going to be about next time? Well, our, our episode next time, uh, beginning with Dionysius, is going to take us to Germany, the Rhineland, the so-called Rhineland mystics, Meister Eckhart, 14th century, back to the 14th century. Dionysius is part of what is known as the apophatic tradition. I'll explain more about that next time. We already touched on it today. The cloud of unknowing is also in the apophatic tradition. And, um, We'll, we'll segue from Dionysius, the apophatic tradition, to Meister Eckhart, who in many ways is also similar to what we discussed today. Well, thank you, Carlos. Another great episode. I want to wish you a very happy Easter, as well as our listeners. 
And I want to thank you all for listening to the Christian Mysticism Podcast. If you have any questions for Dr. Ayer, you'll find our email address in the show notes. Just send it over and we'll try to answer it in a future episode. And don't forget to click the subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode of the Christian Mysticism Podcast. Thank you.